Many of us will never forget the shock and horror we felt after 9-11. Anger, fear, and patriotism spread across America. And in shortly, several months later, President Bush declared war on the Islamic states in the Middle East. Now, 17 years later, there still are some Americans who have some fear and anger toward people from the Middle East. After World War II, Americans felt the same way against the Japanese. I know because I experienced racial prejudice when I was a girl in the 1950s and 60s growing up in Ohio. I was born in 1951 to a Japanese mother and an American father. And I grew up in Whitehall, Ohio, a suburb of Columbus. Now you might find this hard to believe, but my mother and I don't remember seeing any Japanese walking the streets of Columbus or Whitehall in the 50s or 60s. And when my mother went grocery shopping at Big Bear, the only soy sauce she could buy was La Choy. The only rice she could buy was Uncle Ben's, and the only tea she could buy was Lipton's black tea. Since her sisters lived in Los Angeles, they would ship my mother gallons of Kikoman soy sauce, 25 pound bags of Japanese rice, and tins of Japanese green tea. In the 50s and 60s, most families only had one car, so we kids would walk, ride our bikes, take the bus wherever we needed to go. And cars didn't have any air conditioning, so people rode around in their cars down the street with their windows down, spring, summer, and fall. And it was usually then during those times when I was walking down the street by myself, I would hear people yell out the window, hey, Jap, go back to where you belong. Hey, Nip, get out of America. Or, hey, Chink, and they'd give me the third finger salute. Then, what I really hated, were kids would walk up to me and go like, Chinese, Japanese, look at these. This is a picture of me in fourth grade. And this is the year that I remember crying to my mother, why do I have to be Japanese? Why do people hate me? And I hate having slanted eyes. So, so people wouldn't see my face, I started walking down the street with my head down. And I must have done it for years because my college roommate told me she always wondered why you walked across campus with your head down. Now, the racial ex prejudice that I felt, I thought was pretty bad, but I learned that the racial discrimination that my mother experienced in World War II was far worse. When I was preparing for this TED Talk, I was surprised to learn that 100 years ago, after World War I, Americans had strong anti-immigration feelings. They were afraid that all these immigrants were going to pose a national security threat. They also were afraid that immigrants were going to take over all their jobs. So politicians responded, keep California white. Believe it or not, that was the 1920 re-election campaign slogan for US Senator James Phelan. In 1924, Congress enacted the Immigration Act. This act prevented immigrants from certain nationalities, races, and countries from ever becoming US citizens. And it also established a quota as to how many, Jap uh, how many immigrants each country could be allowed to come into the United States. Japan was allotted only 100 per year. Fortunately, for my grand Japanese grandparents, Kichichiro and Tetsuya Koi, they had immigrated to the United States in 1923. From 1923 to 1928, they had four children. My mother, Yoshiko, her sisters, Kazuko and Mizue, and her brother, Haruo. Since Japanese couldn't own any land, my mother's family were tenant farmers, and they raised flowers in East Los Angeles. 
In December of 1941, my mother was 16 years old, a senior at Garfield High School, straight A student with plans on going to college after she graduated. Unfortunately, after Pearl Harbor, my mother's future changed and the future of most Japanese living in America changed drastically. Along the West Coast, companies and federal agencies immediately fired all their Japanese employees. The US Treasury Department froze all Japanese assets. There were anti-Jap signs all over the Pacific West Coast. And national politicians, local politicians, special uh, media and special interest groups all wanted the Japs off the West Coast. Now, there were still some Americans and politicians that didn't agree with having this evacuation. However, they were ignored and remained mostly silent. In February of 1942, President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066. This order authorized the evacuation and detainment of 120,000 Japanese off the Pacific coast. 70% of those Japanese were American citizens. So in March of 1942, the military started rounding up all 120,000 Japanese and sending them to 17 assembly centers. They were told you could only bring what you could carry. So these Japanese had one to six weeks to sell their businesses, sell their homes, sell their belongings, and even give away their pets. While they were in these assembly centers for several months, the US government was building 10 internment camps around the West Western states. In August of 1942, my mother and her family traveled 1,300 miles to Heart Mountain Internment Camp, which was in the northwest corner of Wyoming. While they were on the train, the passengers were told, keep the window blinds down. And armed guards were at each train car door. After 10,000 Japanese were relocated to Heart Mountain, it became the third largest town in Wyoming. However, this town looked a lot different. It was surrounded by barbed wire fence, and it had nine watchtowers, with soldiers, machine guns, and searchlights pointing down at the Japanese residents 24-7. When my mother and her family got off the train, they were assigned a tar paper wooden barrack. All the barracks at Heart Mountain were 20 feet by 120 feet long. And they were divided into six units. Since my mother's family had six members in their family, they got the largest room, a 20 by 24 foot room. So in other words, six people were going to live in this room for years that was only 480 square feet. When they walked in, one light bulb hung from the rafters because there were no ceilings. In the corner, there were army cots and blankets and one pot belly stove. No insulation, no furniture, no privacy, and no running water. My mother said she wasn't prepared for this first winter in Wyoming because they came from Southern California. Unfortunately, the first winter she lived at Heart Mountain, the temperature got to 29 degrees below zero. Can you imagine living in an uninsulated room at 29 degrees below zero? Sometimes she said she would wake up and there'd be snow all over her blanket because it had blown through the cracks in the walls, the windows, and the floors the night before. When she wanted to eat, she had to walk to a mess hall and sometimes stand in line for over an hour to be fed small quantities of poor food because the US government 
only budgeted 45 cents per day per person to feed the Japanese internees. When she wanted to go to the bathroom, she had to walk to a different building that also had a shower. But when she walked into this latrine, there were rows of toilets without any partitions or privacy. She said in the winter, after she would take a shower, by the time that she would walk from the shower building to her barracks, her hair was frozen and the towel she used to dry herself off was frozen stiff. In 1945, the military started releasing all the Japanese from all the 10 internment camps. The last Japanese to leave Heart Mountain was in November of 1945. After living in a, three years of these horrible living conditions, the US government gave every Japanese a free ticket, a free train ticket to wherever they wanted to go in America, but only $25 per person and $50 per family. 70% of the Japanese went back to the West Coast. However, many Japanese also settled in Chicago, Salt Lake City, Denver, and the New York, New Jersey area. And even though they were free from this internment camp, they still faced racial discrimination. People didn't want to give them jobs, and people didn't want to rent or sell them homes. In 1982, a congressional report concluded that Executive Order 9066 was a result of racial prejudice, war hysteria, and the failure of political leadership. My mother just won't talk about her experience at camp, and I don't blame her. She was a 16-year-old girl. Her future vanished just because she was Japanese. This year, I decided to go to a pilgrimage to Heart Mountain, so I invited my mother to come with me. Her answer was, no, I've been there, and I don't want to go back. One of the reasons why I wanted to do this talk, because I recently heard an American tell an immigrant, go back to where you belong. It shocked me, because I heard that same rant said to me as a child 60 years ago. So it really bothers me to see the rise of racism and all the anti-immigration feelings that are crossing America today. Why are people so cruel to each other? And why do some Americans discriminate against people who come from different countries, who might worship different religions, or have a different skin color? We don't choose our parents. We don't choose our race. We don't choose the country where we're born. And we can't change the color of our skin, nor our racial features. I learned as a child that looking Japanese caused discrimination and resulted in the shame of who I was. I believe that the seeds of discrimination can be stopped if we just show people kindness and compassion. By showing kindness and compassion, you might change a person's life. That's what happened to me. When I was 28, a makeup artist told me, you have beautiful Japanese eyes. Let me show you how to apply makeup so your eyes can be accentuated and even more beautiful. I remember going home, staring at the mirror, looking at my eyes, wow, and looking at them in different directions. It's like, wow, I think my eyes look pretty cool, and I kind of like looking Japanese now. So that ugly Japanese girl became a fashion model. This is me 40 years ago, and. 40 pounds lighter, but that's a talk about aging for another time. These children 
were the faces and future of America in 1942. I see Asian, Latino, African, Native, and Caucasian Americans. And if we took a picture of a schoolyard today, we would see these same faces, except we'd probably see Middle Eastern children. I think we need to stop discriminating against each other and start embracing our common humanity. And we need to recognize and celebrate America's great multiracial and diverse culture. Because that's really one of the reasons why America is so great. I'd like to end, you, end this talk with two thoughts. Please remember that any kind of discrimination is just wrong. And please try to show some compassion and kindness to everybody. And as Abraham Lincoln said, with malice towards none and charity for all. Thank you.